1.4, membrane transport. So for things to get in and out of cells and into across the membranes, now some things can do this via simple diffusion, which just means they go from an area of high concentration to low, which requires no um, effort or energy, if you like. Um, and if it's a form of simple diffusion, then there's no channel carrier protein required as well. Now, diffusion happens all the time in everyday situations like here. So we drop some dye or perhaps some cordial into a glass. Um, the kinetic energy of those particles, they will collide and bounce off each other and spread out until they have fairly uniform distribution. Of course, cells, we're talking about getting in and out of membranes as well. Um, but we have a similar thing happening where the solute particles are spreading out. Um, provided they can actually get through the membrane. So actually not a lot of things can get through membranes and cells. There are a few things. Um, we say they're semi-permeable because they only let um, some substances through. Uh, not a lot of charged or highly polar molecules can get through. A little bit of water can. Um, a good example of something that can get through is oxygen that can diffuse rapidly in and out of cells because it can cross that membrane. Um, but they need to be small molecules and they need to be able to pass through that lipid component of the bilayer. So what is a little bit more common we tend to see is actually rather than just going straight through here, um, there's some kind of here, this is a channel or a carrier, some kind of protein that still doesn't require any energy, it's still passive. I'm going from a region of high concentration to low, um, but there's just some kind of region that the substance can pass through. So perhaps here in this channel protein, the pore is um, perhaps also hydrophilic. So something that's charged could pass through. So that's an example where we might see um, this is more likely. Osmosis is a movement of water. So that goes the other direction to the um, concentration of the solute. So in an area that's um, perhaps very um, salty, we might see water moving in. For example, here we can see what happens if we put like red blood cells or plant cells into different solutions. Now these words hypotonic, isotonic and hypertonic are really um, important that you use them when you're describing proteins, hypo and hyper, anything um, in biology or otherwise. Hypo means low, either O for low and hyper is high. Same with things like um, blood glucose and so like hypothermia, for example, and that's describing the solution that's around the cell, so relative to the cell. If we put, for example, this red, red blood cell here into a glass perhaps of pure water or very low concentration of salts or glucose, um, the water would move via osmosis into the cell to try to balance that concentration, and then the cell would swell and potentially burst. Um, whereas hyper, hypertonic means it's really salty outside relative to perhaps the inside, or it doesn't have to be salt, just any solute, um, but the concentration is much higher outside, so the water leaves, it exits, um, and that is going to shrivel our cell or plasmalize it. We can see here that can be um, almost as dangerous as here, although we're not going to get the bursting that we get with something um, placed in a solution that's hypotonic. So that's got quite important applications to things like organ transplants as well. So tissues and organs are, need to be kept in isotonic solutions um, until they're used, so they're not damaged. Um, now I've written here that that can happen with or without a channel. Water can pass through the plasma membrane. Um, it's not super rapid, it can happen faster with channels called aquaporins, which we see, for example, um, in the collector, in the kidney and other places in the body where um, the speed of water transfer is quite critical. Um, and that takes us to active transport. And this is our form of transport that requires an energy input, so ATP. Um, and so we tend to refer to these proteins embedded in the membrane as pumps rather than channels or carriers. Now, here's just a selection of a whole range of different um, proteins in the membrane, some of which are channels, some of which are pumps. Um, so we can see like the ones that require ATP, for example, are, um, are our pumps, they're active, um, and some of them instead just allow for facilitated diffusion. There are also some more complexities about things being moved perhaps in opposite directions to each other or things that are co-transported, travel together, um, and that might mean that um, one substance is, is taken with another down its concentration gradient. But we don't need to go into, in, into that level of detail. What we should revisit, though, um, is the idea of what happens in a neuron. So inside a neuron here along the axon, 
So here, this sort of on the white side or orange, I should say here, or the bottom part um, would be the inside of our axon. So really, really long. There's little branch cells. If you remember, that's a very quick, badly drawn axon here. But we're focusing on this part here in the middle. And relative, again, these sort of um, concentrations of different dissolved solutes. There are lots and lots of them. Um, but our relative charge is different on the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. So I've actually labeled these not in the same order that they are in the picture. It started here, this depolarization, which is this part of our graph. So we start with our potential voltage inside our cell being fairly negative which means, relatively speaking, there are more positive ions on the outside. So when we get an action potential, we say like a neuron's kind of firing, if you like, or sending a nerve impulse, um, we have channels open. Now, so these are channels, this passive facilitated fusion, and we have sodium ions, and they move through the channel. And so that changes the electrical potential of the cell by becoming more positive inside. So it's shot up to here. And then we have channels that go the other way that allow potassium to go out here. And that brings this relatively like more negative here because we've still got other dissolved negative ions. And so if this side becomes more positive again on the outside of the cell, um, we have polarized. So we've lost lots of positives from this part here inside our cell. And then we need, once we're back we, um, to sort of our original charge, we've got our sodiums and our potassiums on the wrong side to where they were to start with. So you see here in purple is lots of sodium, whereas before the sodiums were here on the other side, they were on the outside of the axon. So there's also this um, pump, an active component, this one here in the middle, that switches the potassium and the sodium back to its original side. So that's happening all the time before an um, action potential make sure that's established the concentration gradient that we need um, for the passive processes to happen and then it has to happen after as well which is why I put it here in this sequence I put it third because we're switching back to the original side so that our um, neuron can actually work again and not just be a single use cell. Now what I've shown you this because we need to look at these as examples of channels and pumps. So we're going to look at this um, channel for potassium First of all, down here in the bottom, that one. And then we're going to look at the pump, is that one. So let's have a look at this little channel um, for a moment. So we can see it's made of four protein subunits. Now this representation, all these little curly bits, it's got to do with that structure. That is alpha helices and things in our um, polypeptide structure. Now whole, this is a larger quaternary protein that's made up of multiple polypeptides. If we simplify that a little bit, you can just kind of concentrate on part for a moment. These are our potassium ions that want to come through. Pass down the concentration gradients. It's still passive. Now, at its narrowest point, or perhaps you could see on this diagram, here we've got, um, going the other way, that we've got the smallest part is 0.3 nanometers. Now, that is too small for something bigger than potassium to get through, um, which helps sort of that channel be selective. So not just anything can pass through. It's also too big, though, for something that's smaller. And it, that might seem strange. Why? It's like saying, why is a door too small for someone little to get through? doesn't seem to make sense. Um, but that's got to do with the fact that when in, they're in solution, all the ions, so here's our potassium, um, when it's hanging about in water, so this is oxygen, and hydrogen, that's our water, um, the slightly negative side of the water molecules are attracted to this positively charged potassium ion here. So they surround it in like a little shell. Now what our protein here does, um, it actually has these little amino acid, little, little tails and bits poking out that are attracted to the potassium ions. And that helps them just temporarily get rid of that water shell. So if it's an ion that's even smaller than potassium, it doesn't come close enough to the sides to pull off the water shell. So it's actually the size is quite specific, both to ions being too big or too small. So it can pull the ions away from water. And so this is small enough to fit. It means that we have something specific to 
potassium to get through our channel. And of course, our channel is also voltage gated. So the charges, the change, because we're talking about neurons here and the um, change in electrical potential on either side, that affects the protein structure, which allows it to actually open to the potassiums to get through. And then there's a very quick mechanism here, this kind of ball and chain part. A few milliseconds later, that pulls in when the change occurs with the potassium ions moving through um, before the protein can reset to its original position so that we don't get um, too many potassium ions flowing. It actually closes the potassium. The other example you want to see is our pump, our sodium potassium pump. Now, this requires ATP. It's active. We can see that our sodium goes in on one side and our potassium in on the other side um, and that we have an exchange happening. So all you really need to know is that we have an exchange of our ions that are, requires energy. We actually, actually have to have this phosphate added temporarily. It comes back off again, but it doesn't come off and generate um, new ATP. That high energy um, bond has gone into making this conformational change of our protein. So that energy has been used. Um, in this process and trans transformed into the movement of these ions. So our ATP needs to be regenerated then from cell respiration. But we have transport of ions um, against the concentration gradients and, and it works to move things in different directions and it moves both sodium and potassium. The other thing membranes can do, they can move things via um, using vesicles. So they might move things in by endocytosis or out by, by exocytosis. And that's kind of like that pinching off a soap bubble. Um, and it's got to do with that fluidity of our um, lipid bilayer here that makes up our membrane. So we can bud little, pinch little bits off. And we see the same thing happening in the endomembrane system. We have proteins made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They bud off a little section of that. Um, fuses here with our Golgi body and that pinches off little bubbles of membrane as well, our vesicles, that then merge with our outer membrane as well to secrete something. What else we see in this topic? We see practical two. So one of those techniques you can be um, assessed on. That's where we stamped out bits of potato with a cork borer, um, left them in some different solutions, perhaps overnight or for a couple of hours, and then and recorded either the percentage change in mass or perhaps it was a change in length. So some important things to note, you have to keep control of where the tissue is coming from, make sure perhaps they're all the same length um, and width with a cork borer, that's also energy that, um, and your mass, make sure you can trim it then, so you get the mass on the scales, leave them for the same length of time, all those sorts of things that I think you, at this stage in the course, you guys know a lot about controlled variables. Um, and then you would want to take several replicates so that you can get error bars on your graph by taking the standard deviation. Um, showing percent change is better in case there are small differences in mass or length to start with. Then as a percentage of the original, you're going to get something that's more consistent. Um, and you also need to be careful with your trend line. So this person here has done a linear trend line, but it looks to me as though perhaps the data actually is starting to level off down here. So you might see something, it might be better in this case just to join your dots or do a bit of a curve line by eye. But what you're doing by then interpolating that data, which means looking between the points rather than extrapolating, which is looking past them, is to try to work out what point there's no change. And that would tell you at what concentration, so depending on what you used, salt, or sucrose, table sugar, you could find the concentration of the solution that's isotonic to the osmolarity of the samples. 